In 1808, French soldiers occupied strategic cities all over Spain, which had been forced into an alliance with France eight years ago. After arresting the royal family, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, installed his brother as King of Spain. When French soldiers tried to capture one of Charles de Bourbon's sons in Madrid, this led to an uprising at the 2nd of May, which was brutally crushed by French forces. All over Spain, civilians and Spanish soldiers incited by the church picked up their guns in anger and began an attritional resistance against the Grande Armée, which itself ruthlessly answered the unrest with brute force. During the following six years of war, the Spanish established an asymmetrical style of fighting, since then known as guerrilla warfare. It is at this time, somewhere in Spain, that our little story takes place. In need of supplies, a group of French soldiers led by a chasseur à cheval leave their camp and roam through the mountainous countryside, while some Spanish guerrilleros and their chief lay out an ambush and patiently await the enemy. See how this fight turns out in Guerrillas of the Peninsula War, an 18 card print and play war game for two players designed by Joe Schmidt. To play Guerrillas of the Peninsula War, you need to print 18 cards, which I have here, sleeved, and uh, printed also the back of the cards, cut and sleeve them, as you can see here, which you can download at Board Game Geek. You find the link in the video description. The game comes with three and a half pages of rules with some examples and pictures and also tables and so on but if you like you can also download this a simple player aid which i made um you find also in the file section board game geek and it just shows the tables the same as in the roots of course and an additional stress display which you can use if you want to. Of course you need one six-sided die. The rules state you need uh, six six-sided dice, but really you could go with one if you want to. Then you need a few tokens which you have to borrow from some other game you own that are two markers for the guerrilla chief, two for the chasseur à cheval, four for the regular French units or soldiers, and six for the guerrilleros. So I choose here to use red for the Spanish or the guerrilleros and blue for the French. And then you need another additional 10 tokens of another color, so these here are yellow, these uh, indicate supply points collected by the French. So first let's have a look at the cards. We have two character cards and that are one card for the French chasseur and one card for the guerrilla chief. We will have a look at their abilities and what role they play in this game later on. And then we have three action cards for the French and three action cards for the Spanish, for the guerrilleros. And although there are differences in the names or the headlines these cards have, they uh, give exactly the same amount of actions and uh, bonuses to each side. So here we have one that is uh, identical in, in, in both decks it's called Advance and uh, it gives uh, each player up to four actions with no additional effects. And then we have Raid and Patrol 
which is the same cause it allows to take up the three actions and the ability to re-roll one combat die and how combat works we will have a look at this too of course and then we have here ambush for the Spanish and charge for the French and these allow to take up to two actions and add a plus one to all combat rules. Now let's see we have we have uh, ten cards done uh, which are terrain cards and uh, with them the, our terrain or our map or however you want to call it is built. So first we have a French camp which will be placed here. And then we have a Spanish camp or a base or however you want to call it and it is placed down here maybe. So these two cards to explain they are also uh, only for uh, setting up the game and they have no effects. Then we have two cards which show it zero on top and uh, these cards are simply considered to be clear terrain with no effect on combat or movement. Then we have two cards that show an X symbol on the left top and these two cards are considered to be mountainous terrain or or you can call it rough terrain. We have a few cards that show buildings here, little houses, hacienda possibly, and um, here like some some small town with a chapel and a dwell and something, and here a little village with a church maybe and some some bigger houses. As you can see, these cards they show numbers and red dots in the left upper corner and these numbers here 111 and 2 they show the possible supply points that can be collected one should say in these towns and villages by the French soldiers if they are in the end phase or during the end phase the only forces in these towns or the village. Then we have these red dots down here, one, one, and two, and another two here. These indicate the starting positions of guerrilleros um, when we set up the game. To, so to show you how it works, I pick up all these cards, I give them a shuffle, a proper shuffle, so the terrain will be mixed through and through, and then we build up our map by putting two cards in the first row. Then we will put four cards in the middle row. And the remaining two cards go down here in the last row. You can see we have here the big village. We have some clear terrain over here. Here are the mountains. And yeah, some, some little houses and towns and whatsoever in the center of the map. And notice that these terrain cards, they are considered as if they were hexes. So you can move units to every adjacent card. So if we had an guerrilla unit here, it could move to this, 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 and this card indeed. So it's not like a side-scroller that you have to maybe move yeah, from, from left to right and in the opposite direction maybe. No, you can move to every adjacent or any adjacent card, actually. So let's set up the game. The guerrilla chief, he will join here in his base and then we put one guerrilla unit for every red dot and then we put all our French soldiers together with the French chasseur in the French camp. Now let's lay down our characters. We can put them down here. So here we have the guerrilla chief himself 
He rolls two dice during combat, hitting on rolls of three or higher, and he has a spirit of three, which is indicated here. And he has the lay of the land that allows all friendly tokens to enter X map cards for one action. So these difficult terrain cards, they cost two action points to enter. So the French have to spend two points if they wanted to enter this card. The Spanish, they can spend one action point and get into it. So they don't have to spend the additional second action point to do this. And that is because the guerrilla chief, he is an experienced Spanish soldier and he knows the terrain, he knows his, his home, the countryside and so on. He knows uh, like hidden trails through the mountains and so on and so on. Then we have here the French Chasseur à Cheval. He rolls two dice in combat, hitting on rolls of four or more, and he has a spirit of five. See this? The guerrilla chief only has a spirit of three. The chasseur, as uh, considered to be a skilled and trained and veteran soldier of the Grande Armée, maybe he served uh, under Napoleon in, in Italy and uh, at Austerlitz and, and wheresoever, so... He is like really a, a drilled, uh, battle-hardened soldier. He has a high spirit. And he has an exceptional ability. Uh, his inspiring presence allows him to lose one spirit in order to cancel one stress of any unit that is inflicted, inflicted in any combat anywhere on the battlefield. And before the game starts, uh, the guerrilla chief, or the Spanish player, has the special ability to swap two cards. And as the Spanish want to prevent the French to simply get supplies, forage supplies, they will, I think, take this card over here with the village and swap it out with this mountainous terrain or the hard terrain, rough terrain so that the village now is here so you might consider this um, or imagine the the French recon is, is really bad someone or they have maybe some local guide and he tells them he told them yeah you can go here to the east and there is there is uh, this village where you can forage some supplies and so on and they believed him and and actually it, it turned out it was it was a lie and actually the the village is down here not here there's simply rough mountains where the french soldiers will have it hard to to march through actually. So now to these action cards um, or yeah let, let's go with the action cards actually. So as you may have noticed and as I told you these action cards give the players a specific amount of action. So may, for example advance gives four actions to the French player and um, some give, you see here, plus one to all combat rolls or re-roll one combat die. So special abilities um, you can use during combat. And the way these cards work is quite an interesting way, as I think. Um, they are considered to be orders given uh, by... Don't want to say high command by, but uh, by an officer, major, or whatsoever who is, uh, yeah, near near the camp maybe, and uh, gives his orders to the chasseur and his men, and the French player or each player, the Spanish uh, too, they have to arrange these cards 
uh, in the order they want to play them during the action phase, which consists out of three called sub-phases or how, however you want to call it. And let's say, so a charge is not the best in, in the first uh, round actually. So let's say the French, they want to advance, so they want to, to use four actions to maybe get their soldiers or a few soldiers over here and attack this gear a guerrero there so they want to play advance first so this card has to be the last card in this deck of cards and then let's say they want a patrol which gives them a three action so they can uh, bring the soldiers that are left behind in the camp uh, to the front and the last card should be charge which gives plus one to all combat roads during combat, so this should be the last card uh, of the phase which they want to use when they already have assembled uh, a considerable force to fight some guerrilleros. And then the card deck is flipped and the Spanish they will do the same. So uh, let's say I'm playing the solo, so I'm just randomly shuffling these, turn this around and place the cards somewhere we can see them maybe here and uh, then the the first action phase begins which uh, as i said consists out of three turns and both sides they will flip the first card of their action card deck and we will compare them as you can see the french uh the french order is advance so they get up to four action with no additional effects and the spanish order is raid they get up to three actions and may re-roll one combat die now at the beginning of a turn and during these this action phase uh, we have to see uh, which side has the initiative and this is um, made by comparing the number of action each side gains by these order cards and as the French has the higher number he gets uh, four actions and the Spanish only get three uh, the French have the initiative and they will start the turn and now they have four actions they can conduct so now let's have a look closer look at the actions table here at my on my little player aid. So you can see there are four kinds of actions that can be conducted. They, these are move, enter hills, attack and assault. And each of these actions has uh, uh, a cost that um, for uh, therefore you need to, to spend action points. So to move a unit to an adjacent card, you pay one action point. And let's have a look at the map. So the French could move one unit here and they would pay one action point. Indeed, uh, or actually they also can move again, pay a second action point and they are not like uh, engage with this guerrilla unit they are considered to be on horseback and just riding through the countryside they are just just passing and and they they don't make contact they maybe they don't even realize they are in the same region or whatsoever uh, indeed this would be not the best move you could uh, make as the French but notice that this is possible so moving into clear terrain which I uh, want to recall is not rough terrain or mountainous terrain we have two cards of these all others are like clear terrain which uh, costs only one action point to move in then we have enter hills which costs two actions and you see 
I mean, it's it's like really clear. Moving one French unit into these hills would cost the French two action points. And remember, the guerrilla chief gives the Spanish soldiers or the guerrilleros the possibility to move into mountains and just pay one action point. So they are kind of more mobile or f traveling faster, riding faster as they know uh, the terrain. And um, yeah, if uh, maybe this mountain would be like here in this position, the, that would would have been like a, a good blockade. Um, the French um, or the Spanish actually could have used um, to to hide behind and like use the time to to gather forces together, join them and support each other, and then like uh, move in and, and punch the French maybe. So then the third action is attack. And it costs one uh, additional action point per card uh, where you want to resolve combat. So if the French move one unit here, pay one action point by moving, and move one here, paying two action points for moving, uh, say they have spent three doing this, and they only have one action point left, so they would have to decide where they want to attack if they wanted to. They cannot, like, give the attack order and attack in both places. That's not possible. You might want to consider that. And then there is, like, the special attack, the mighty attack, the assault, which costs two actions. Once per round, you have to... to um, pay these so these are not like card bind as the attack is for the attack you pay one uh, action point per card mm, but for the assault you pay two action points and you can like resolve every combat um, and you add one die to any friendly combat row so you can decide maybe you have your, uh, let's say it's, it's the Spanish and they have their guerrilla chief uh, in combat and he is like a really um, experienced uh, warrior soldier. He is considered to be a an, an, uh, soldier uh, of the Spanish army who is like leading here the, the, the civil uprise and... Uh, the, the guerrilleros um, and he he hits on roads of three or more so if you could give him one additional die how powerful is that as we are talking about combat let's have a closer look on the combat table so we see here again what I just uh, read from the cards the character cards the guerrilla chief he rolls two combat dice and he hits on three or higher and has a spirit of three. The French chasseur also rolls two dice and hits on four or more and has a spirit of five. Now the guerrilleros they roll only one die as do the French soldiers but the guerrilleros hit on five or six and the French soldiers on four, five and six but both have only one spirit. So Let's talk about spirit then. What's this spirit? Spirit is like, you know, it's the morale of the troops. Uh, it's like their combat spirit, literally. And um, if they lose their spirit, they are like defeated. They are running away. They cannot fight anymore. They are lost for the side. As you notice, these regular units or average units uh, in comparison to the characters they only have one spirit so if they are taking one point of stress their spirit is gone and they are out of the fight so now what is stress then you may wonder and I tell you uh, during combat um, 
We roll dice, both player roll dice, and they will, like, if you want to, I have here this, this little stress display, but you can do it however you want. Um, they would note how many, uh, like, hits they have inflicted during the combat, and after both players rolled for the combat, so let's say maybe uh, here are like two French units and there's one Guerriero, so the French would uh, roll two dice uh, and would have to roll four or higher to inflict one stress. And um, the Spanish, uh, the Guerriero, he needs, he only has one. Um, die and needs to roll a five or higher. So let's say he rolls a five and uh, the French, they roll maybe a four and a six or so. So they, they, um, the players note the French inflict two stress, the Spanish inflict one stress. And after these die rolls, um, the differential is made between these the inflicted stress. So um, there is one more stress inflicted by the French on the Spanish than the Spanish could inflict on the French, which means the Spanish suffer one stress, which means they lose one fighting spirit. In this case, this would mean that this Guerrero unit is out of combat and is, it is running away or it's, it's, it's like shot into pieces or I don't know, you could imagine whatever you want. I find quite interesting that the rules don't say your units are killed or what, like in every normal game, like you're fighting and, and they are killed. No, losing the spirit does not have to mean they are killed, they are running away, they are putting down their guns, they are captured whatsoever, what you can imagine. So, remember, the guerrilla chief and the chasseur, they have more than one spirit, so um, the guerrilla chief, he can, like, take three um, hits, if you want, and only after that he would be out of fight. And the French chasseur, he has five, but um, he has the special ability to cancel one stress point um, by losing one spirit himself. So let's say uh, we have maybe three French soldiers here in this little town. Um, they are engaging these two guerrilleros here, and you might think, yeah, that that should go should go well for the French as they have the better uh, to hit. Um, but maybe the dice luck is not in their favor at all, but is in the favor of the Spanish, and uh, maybe the the Spanish the guerrilleros they inflict one more. Uh, stress on the French, which would mean actually that one of the French units had to leave combat, had to leave the game. And as you can see, the French only have four units, so every unit lost is like really a really pain in the ass for them because they need them uh, to fight and they need them to collect supply points. So in this case, the French player may consider to uh, lose one spirit with the French chasseur uh, to prevent this French unit to be like stressed out of combat. Okay, so um, and the game continues and continues. So after the French had made their moves, let's just imagine they had. Uh, the Spanish would do their moves, then the first turn of the combat phase is done. Both sides turn their cards, it's checked for uh, initiative. In this case, the Spanish have advantage, which gives them four, the French only three. So the Spanish 
would be the first to move and so on and so on and this goes uh, like three uh, turns and after the these three turns um, we enter the so-called end phase and in the end phase the French collect or they can collect supply points and store them like in their in their account um, as victory points if they are in a village uh, or in these indicated cards on these cards uh, and there are no uh, Spanish units so if like this was were like this so we have here French units and there is no Spanish unit on this card the French would get one supply and this is checked like in every uh, in every end phase so the French can obviously collect supply out of the same village in different end phases and uh, after that uh, you have to check if one of the sides gained 10 or more victory points 10 points are needed to win the game and let's have a close look to the objectives table here we see um, what the two sides have to do to, to earn these points, to gain the points. Uh, let's say the guerrilleros, they only want to kill the French sir, and the uh, soldiers. And for each token, or, or like, like defeat them, turn, push them out of combat. Um, for each token they, that leaves the combat, they get two points. So remember, they have like one, two, three, four, and five units, the French. So the Spanish have to push all of them out of combat to win the game. The French, on the other hand, they want to collect, one should say, supply tokens, and they get one point for each such supply token. And they can defeat the guerrilla chief, which gives them one victory point, and they get a half a point for each guerrero defeated. So they, they can decide which uh, approach they want to go, and obviously it would be a mixture of both. So they they will attack um, the guerrilleros, and uh, they will also try to collect supply points. So that's it. That is my little roots overview hope you know now how to play the game so there is really really m much to consider playing this game and that is like uh, speaking about kind of review of the game or why I think this is a quite interesting game indeed uh, is because even though it is a clear and simple design, I mean, look at these cards. They are like, even though they are like uh, only showing schemes or however it's called, um, they are really like streamlined, simple design, but indeed they are like uh, given the the atmosphere of a Spanish countryside as you would imagine it maybe when you think about um, the Peninsula War and uh, I mean this this little design works very well with the different kinds of terrain and uh, the possibility for the pre the French to use it, and the French they have to they, they have to look out where are the mountains. Uh, they don't want to go through the mountains. It's like too costly. They have to spend too many action points to do that. So uh, they want to be in the right place. Both sides want to be in the right place at the right time. And that needs to be prepared by this sequence of these order cards or action cards. 
So you have the right order during the right turn in the right moment during the phase and you have to consider what might my opponent do, where, which strategy might he want to choose, where will he be in like two turns ahead and you have to consider all these things and then he moves and he does maybe really the opposite of what you expected of him, uh, what he would do and then you have to react and really interesting little design here and I mean it's like 18 cards you need some tokens and a die and you could take this don't know everywhere you want and let's let's just play a little game it is like the rules say for 15 or 30 minutes is the duration of the game it is for ages 10 upwards um, and I feel the roots are quite simple. I mean, I had some questions, but only to to be sure. And Joe Schmidt, the designer of the game, he answered these questions via Board Game Geek. So you can have a look there in the forums if you want to know what I was thinking about or was uh, what I was questioning myself. And wanted to be wanted to have some clarifications and uh, yeah actually so let's let's sum it up little easy streamlined clear design easy routes uh, easy system like okay you, you need to have these tables but I mean that's all they are also included in in the routes so if you don't want to have this play rate I made just look and at the roots so they are here you can use these um i suggested joe that he might want to put these tables onto cards and he said wow what a good idea that would really fit nicely into this whole design so have a look at board game geek i uh, don't know when he will add these but uh, as he is thinking about or working on really two additional characters and I'm, I'm really curious about these, how they would work, what, which abilities they will have. Um, so he might add these tables on the cards when he adds two additional characters, maybe. I don't know when this would be, but... Again, and just have an eye on the board game geek page then. So yeah, you could put it into a little box or don't know, put it in your pocket even, and you could play this or wherever you want, um, like a little, a little game you play in between something or while or. Meeting with some friends or whatsoever. You you can even play the solo. So I mean, I mean, mm, you would have to decide where to go, and you have to to play both sides really. But you could simply turn these over, flip these over, and uh, shuffle them, so you don't know which card will be coming and which turn of the phase and uh, you could even do this for both players if you wanted to and then you you make yourself like a little house rule uh, where to move or you you uh, assign uh, a a strategy to both sides in a random way or so and you could play this solo I mean why not Say a funny little game, and I consider it a quite good design. I mean, I mean, war games. I mean, this 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 is a war game, and and this is really a simple approach. But you might know it to design the simple games is often the hardest to do. 
I mean, there are so many, like, heavy, heavy war games, like, with maps, don't know, won't fit on any actual average table or so, have, like, 500, 500 counters all over the place, and, man, these games, I don't know. I don't know. I like simple designs. I like this. I like... The Napoleonic 20 series and some other nice games and I think game designers they should always come back to simple designs making a complex game with bunch of decision making but make the game easy make it like easy for newbies to get in learn the rules I mean, the rules often are a mess in many games. A mess. They need to be structured. They need to be, like, well organized and, like, structured in a logical way. Um, in a way that players can, like, if they stumble over something, they get a question. You need to be able to pick up the roots, open them, and boom, you find the answer to your question. So they have to be logically organized in sense of gameplay and not in sense of like a law or something. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, the, but I'm I'm going way, way, way away from this. Um, nice little game uh, I hope you enjoyed this little rule overview and review video and uh, yeah give me a thumbs up subscribe if you want to definitely go uh, to board game geek check out this nice little game